Bernie, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe, and tonight we have the amazing, the phenomenal, the spectacular Maria Gillen, who, with her co-creation cohorts, is going <laughs> to give us a story or ten. Maria, the floor is yours. Hi. <laughs> John, thank you so much for that absolutely magnificent um, introduction. I hope I can live up to it now. <laughs> so I, I've been having, myself and John have been having great conversations about the importance of stories in today's world, and particularly during this time of uh, COVID lockdown. So I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but I met John Rowe in the cyber borderless lands where there's no borders and um, during story time. And it was a, it's been magnificent and we've had great conversations and it feels like I know John well. And that has been one of the silver linings of the COVID cloud. As well as that, we've been looking at how important story is to us as individuals and also in Ireland to us as a country and a culture, much like Marrakesh and other countries have been doing as well. So we um, and Kerry Writers Museum is where I'm storyteller in residence and they're just an amazing team. I'm sure one or two of them will be either logged in on Facebook now or will be coming in on the join button. And they said, how can we have stories so that they're very inclusive so that we can include everybody and i talked about a co-creation model of stories that i was interested in when i was training to be a drama therapist and it has a huge therapeutic benefits and it's by an israeli man by the name of muli lahad it's called the six part story and I absolutely love it. And of course, I've Irishized it and I've made it my own. And uh, Biotina has been celebrated all of this month. So this the month of May is the month, month of Biotina in Ireland. And it's the month where we look back and respect the old wisdoms. And we've all heard that saying that when an old person dies, it's like there's a library has burnt down. And I have been talking with war babies in Ireland, so people who've lived through World War Two, and we won't have that experience around forever. So it's really important to collect that while we still can. Um, but there was other beautiful things that I'd forgotten until we started looking at these collective stories. Things like the mehel. The, um, the mehel is an Irish word for everybody gathering together to bring in somebody's harvest. And then everybody gathers together to bring in somebody else's harvest. And a great community builds up from that. And that's why the cooperative societies work so well in Ireland, because for millennia we've been standing shoulder to shoulder and helping one another out and one of the stories that we collected in Biotina was about the Mehel Meadow, about the meadow of gathering neighbours and um, so this could be a good time now to to tell that story and then I'll have a quick check and see if there's um, any more of my co-creators in. So I see right now that we have Ray McKinley and Anita Howard. Hello, Ray. Hello, Anita. And they were both part of this gorgeous group of collective energy that built this story. And I've brought my notebook with me. This is my notebook with the doctor's writing. See it there? So you see how we divide the page into six parts. And we put in key words and that's what makes the story. But the beauty of this is as you're building the story collectively together, you're also making some of your own stories. 
and Michelle McCormick was on to me today to say that she almost has one ready for us now. So this is she's new to using this mechanism and yet she has a story ready almost to rock right now. So here's the story of the Mehel Meadow. Um, just have to be careful now to get the name right. I'm going to call her Nora O'Leary. Nora O'Leary was a short, stocky little woman. People would say, looking at her in photographs, that she was quite plain. But what made her really beautiful was her shining eyes and her ready smile. She always had the soft word for everybody. And in turn, when you spent time with Nora O'Leary, you found your own pace slowing down and you saw the world as a little bit nicer than you might have done before. It was the time of Mehel. Mehel in the time of September when they were bringing the harvests in and it was a fine harvest that year. Everybody gathered in the Mehel Meadow and there was plenty of food brought. There was egg sandwiches, there was jelly for afterwards, there was tomato sandwiches with a fine sprinkling of salt, there was warm potatoes and cold potatoes because the potatoes were in plentiful supply after the fine harvest and there was bottles of tea. The tea used to be put into the cider bottles with the little clicky tops and that way it never spilled and it kept it warm warm but not hot on those glorious metal days in the metal meadow and there was characters that defined that time and space characters like mickey joe and his dray horse who went clip clap clip clap through the village mickey joe was always there if you needed a piece of furniture moved or a fence mended, or if you needed help with his horse. And this day, he brought his horse to the edge of the Mehel Meadow field, opened the gate, took off all of the fetters and left him with just the, with the reins hanging down. And the horse ran into the field as if he was a young horse, even though he'd seen many summers. And he threw the mane up in the air and he swatted away the flies with his tail. And from anyone who offered him an apple, he accepted the gift. There was a young boy there. His name was Joseph and he used to love going to the local cinema. In those days, they had black and white films called cliffhangers because it always ended at the edge of a cliff and you didn't know if the hero was going to live or die. But the most important thing were that all of the adventures happened on the back of a horse and there was nothing like the bond between a man and his horse. Well, when Joseph saw the dray horse, he scrambled up on top of him. Sure, he only looked like nothing but a big long lace with his long skinny hands and his long skinny legs. And yet he managed to get up on top of the back of the horse. The horse was good humoured about it and was cantering around the field until the boy caught hold of the reins. He wrapped the reins around both of his skinny little hands and then he started to pull on the reins. The horse, who had never been treated roughly in his life, started to get afraid. He made noises to indicate it. <laughs> But the boy took no notice, full of the excitement of holding the reins, and he pulled them back further still. And if he did, the whites of the eyes of the horse started to roll, and he ran down the field. Everybody in the field stopped and stood stock still as the young boy started to cry, My hands! My hands! 
and Mr. Murphy, thinking that he was doing good, said, Loosen the reins, boy! Loosen the reins! But because he was shouting, it unnerved the horse even more. And the young boy was so full of panic that he couldn't leave any words in. And then in the middle of all of the heat and frenzy, the little words started to come out. Shade of the Hawira, Talon the Grosta, Nora saying her prayers, and everybody joined in. A water day, they said, Mother of God, a water day. And everything began to slow. And then everything came to a full stop. And Nora looked at Mickey Joe, and she took an apple out of her pocket and gave it to him, for Mickey Joe would know what to do with the horse. Taran Shaw Taran Shaw he said, come here my darling, come here my own little heart. And the horse came slowly towards his master and Mickey Joe gave him the apple and he put his head down to the grass to graze once more. Get that boy off the back of the horse, Nora said, and they lifted him down and she went to look at his hands. Ah, Joseph, she said, don't worry, Mokri, giving him the soft word. She will be better before you're twice married. Ah, Mokri, take it easy, talk a bug, eh? Joseph is an old man now, but he remembers that day in the Mehel Meadow so long ago and how they made sure the skinny boy got a slice of apple tart and soft words and a big mug of tea and how someone pressed a shining shilling into his hand a shining shilling that he never spent even though sometimes he had the need of it a shining shilling that he had even to this day and you could see the round of it in the palm of his hand. <laughs> there you go. There's my, I just want to say hello again to my lovely cake co-creators, Ray and Anita. And when we were making that story, I, I'd like to have a little conversation with them if we could unmute Ray and if we could unmute Anita. And to say, um, what was it like to work together to create a story like that? So maybe we come to Ray first and then we come to Anita. So Ray. Well, I really had fun rekindling the memories that I had forgotten. And the heroes and heroines, the unsung people that I realized were really heroes but I never really appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anita, can I come to you and, and ask what was it like to be in the breakout rooms and the small groups and sharing that information between you? Well, I, I suppose it was like giving a new, a new lease of life to, pe to the people who had inspired the story and chose how they they can continue to live in their own way in the world of the story. Absolutely, you know. And um, would you, you know, I, I know that we were supposed to do it one week and people just kept coming back. So can you say a little bit about that, Ray, about coming back, you know? Well, to be honest, I would have loved to have done the whole three of them because I, I thought it was only once that we had to do it, so I had to book the dentist and I. But coming back on Friday, it was a great affinity experience. Yeah. And there was something about bonding to get... It was kind of like... The, even people who maybe had different experience, there was always something shared, something in common. And you could see the common ground that people had... There was this thread that flowed through us all. Yeah, the and it was really good. Flowing. It was definitely very uh, 
or heartwarming. And I actually came out and I started going down memory lane and bringing these, you know, characters alive. And I just had a fantastic time. Oh, that's great to hear, Ray. And I see there that Michelle McCormick has come in as well. And Michelle sent me this beautiful email today about how she's fashioning a story from the six part mechanism. So Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about the tools that you picked up? What I thought was fantastic, Maria, was um, the um, with the phrase I used, the popcorning, yeah. which was great with the words. So when, when you, you know, you think of something and you know, like well, just one word, and just all the images that come to mind come to, you know, I suppose the emotions that come when you, when you were giving us, this, we were doing a story, and we were doing, say, you know, the field and the horse, and we all kind of took, you know, took it on from there. And as Ray just said, the way um, something would just come to you, you know, great, and, and the way we just all fashioned it really good. So I love the popcorning. So it just kind of it was like brainstorming, basically. Oh, brilliant you know so that's a tool actually that I brought in from improv and a story colleague of mine um <clears throat> excuse me Orla McGovern we often play with popcorning you know so Orla is, is very well known on the world storytelling cafe as well and I see there Noreen has come in as well hello Noreen great to see you hi Maria how are you not too bad at all would you like to share a little bit about your own experience of maybe how it would have made a difference during COVID to ha to be able to all come together online for something like this? It would have been great, actually. And I was actually on the tree workshops. So what I really found fascinating was the instant trust we all had with each other to share sort of intimate stories about our loved ones. And some of those were people who had passed away and we'd never met these people before. But I think to be fair to you, I think you coordinated it all and I think you created a safe space for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think you're very, I think you're not only gifted, but I think you're, you've got, you're a gift for everybody. And I think you're very natural at doing it. So I think it was a great privilege to be in the tree workshops. And I was lucky as well because I worked with a few people in a few chat out rooms. So we'd already <laughs> knew a little bit about each other or whatever. So um, I just think what I loved about it was, because I'm doing this course at the moment on the science of health and happiness and the wild card of surgeons. And they're saying that it's sometimes if you're immersed in something that totally immerses you, that you forget about everything. That is done as something where you're actually using, using your creativity and you kind of really can park a lot of what your worries and anxieties are, whatever. And I think when you go down memory lane, you kind of tap into the feelings that you have at the time and stuff. And I must say, you know, there was just a beautiful group with, yeah. with like rich, rich stories. Uh -huh. And there's a great group here as well. You know, there's there's some of my favorite people. I, you know, there's the two David Thompsons and there's Baba here and there's Mike Faculty. And, you know, we've we've done stories together before. So it's lovely now to show these story colleagues that I've also met in cyberspace some of the ways that we put stories together that we, you know, kind of that we co-create stories. Um, and I suppose it's been done like this since time immemorial in Ireland, you know, where you'd sit down and you'd say he said, she said, and, you know, you could tell a story to an audience of 30 and 30 versions of that story would go forward, <laughs> which I absolutely love, you know. So um, I just wanted to come back to Anita um, as well, because Anita is involved in so many different online things. And she's uh, the Banatee in Cork Yarn Spinners, my home club. And they do great work there as well, you know. So, Anita, what was it like to hear one of our stories told in Cork Yarn Spinners last Thursday? Well, I'd 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 say it was familiar because because I'd heard because I'd heard it before, yeah. and also also uh, it was obviously engage, engaging a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then there was your part in it, you know, because you you had uh, named the character and apologies, my head is, you know, kind of demented at the moment. But the name was important, as you said before, because it was the name of somebody who'd been important in your life and you'd lent that to the story, <clears throat> you know. So um, so did you feel an ownership or did you feel your part in that story? Um, I, I did. I did. Yes, I. Um, I felt it. Felt it was um, a trip. 
a part part of part of a trip a tribute to her that um could probably never be big enough considering the impact she had on my life but that's that's obviously another story absolutely and um it, it the, the effect the effect it probably had on me um would probably have been to be to think think about other meaningful aspects that came from it from the story and other other ways that the same character or her attributes could be fitted into other stories oh i just love that so that brings us to the part to the part where you know kind of each story has a layer that touches a truth or touches another story you know and when we were collecting these stories a lot of them came from people's real experience, but it was the essences that we harvested rather than the names, you know, so, and it was just wonderful to be able to, to get people's take on it, you know, so one of our, our male contributors has just come in, Paddy Regan. Hello, Paddy, and welcome. How are you doing, Maria? <laughs> I've, 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 been, I've been listening to you from the very start. Oh, but very I, good. I wasn't. Unusually, I wasn't being shown on camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know. So, um, Paddy, just from you know, um, from the in terms of memory, do you find that um, the six part story w was a, a good tool for you? Would you use it again? Well, I, I think it's I think it's a wonderful mechanism because um, you isolate. Um, what I found about it was when it came to each box into which you would put content of one kind that um, you would, uh, there you are, there you are. You would uh, say if you were starting with the characters, you know, you'd, you'd think of a character. But then when it came to the situation, because it's a different box, there'd be memories of other situations would pop up. So you'd get different elements, not necessarily related uh, mm -hmm. in each element. And then you were the masters, the master or the mistress, if you want to be politically correct, who would join all those different elements together to produce a wonderful story at the end of it. Absolutely. Although if I was to tell the story, I'd start with a character and I would tend to follow the line and life of that character. But because you were asking for different elements in each box, you were taking different elements from your life or your history or from other stories that you knew. So it's a, it's a marvelously creative um, idiom as far as I'm concerned but you do need a master to tie it all together with all due respect <laughs> thank you well I, I suppose uh, the way we were working it was online and it was very different for me because oftentimes you could spend two or three weeks just looking at the character and then yeah. another two or three weeks just looking at the environment yeah. but because we were working really quickly I had to say, I only need two people now to help me with this box. I need two more people to help me with the other box. And there was a degree of, um, th there was a gift in that because we had to concentrate our thinking, but also there was a loss in that. And John Rowe will tell you from co-creating stories, there is nothing like being with people to do this. Yes. And uh, we're actually planning on bringing this to Kerry Writers Museum as a workshop and I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to getting warm bodies yeah. in yeah. a room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and I'm sure you'll be there, Noreen. I'm sure. Oh, I'm absolutely will. I'm promoting a stall big time at the moment. Very good. Very I got good. a few people. I'm even I even joined Facebook at the weekend, can you believe it? In order to I can put my comments. I know, I really appreciate that. Noreen gave us beautiful comments and we asked her to put them up on Facebook. And so she joined Facebook to do it. And I, I just I just felt that in my heart, Noreen. Thank you so much. You're you welcome. Know. So I'm going to go on now to another story. So we, we collected a number of stories for Bialtana. And during Bialtana, we had a focus. And the focus was to collect wisdoms. And wisdoms, you know, I had a great trainer who said, wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Sometimes to be wise, you have to be a whiz at being dumb. Isn't that great? A whiz at being dumb for the wisdom. <laughs> I like that, Baba. <laughs> oh, lovely. So this next story is full of wisdom and common sense um, and joy. And we got a beautiful, we had an artist in our group and she, 
she drew a beautiful girl and it's all over our um the 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 facebook for kerry writers museum and um, so this character got drawn along with uh, created in story and so this girl was called Lauren. Lauren was five years old and everything was great in her world and she woke up every day with a big smile on her face and she loved to put her hands out like that Baba and swirl and twirl and twirl until she fell down and she had a great friend and her friend was Marion and wherever you saw Laurel you saw Marion's head too and they had a great life and they were really enjoying things until one day the news came that her gorgeous granny, who she hadn't seen in months, had gone to heaven. Now she didn't know what that meant, but she knew that she wouldn't be seeing granny for a while because she wouldn't be going to heaven, not for a while anyway. And heaven was very far away, so she became sad. And whenever Lauren was sad, she talked to her mom and her mom came up with a plan. She says, do you know what we'll do? We go down to Granny's caravan in Yall. Will we do that? Yeah, Mom, said Lauren. That would be brilliant. And will we make Granny's custard? Will we do that, Mom? She said, we will. And will we bring Marion, Mom? Sure, we will. So they put everything they had into the car, including Marion, and they went off down the road to Yall, where the waves of the Atlantic Ocean were coming in as if they were bringing messages from granny herself and they got out of the car and they opened the caravan and they aired it out and then mommy said how do we make granny's custard and she says well mom you'll have to do granny's job you'll heat the milk and then i'll measure the custard and then we'll have to stir it and when we stir it we have to sing a song because it can't be too fast and it can't be too slow so we must sing a song We'll sing. If you go down to the woods today, you better not go alone. If you go down to the woods today, you better go in disguise. And so they made the custard and they remembered Granny. And then they took the big bowl of custard and they put it on a table outside the caravan. And it was it was Lauren's job to mind the custard. But Marion said, tell me all about your Granny. And she said, Granny, Granny was marvellous. Granny would come at Christmas and she'd come at Easter and she'd always have toys or chocolate. Granny never came empty handed and she was always full of stories. She told the best stories in the whole world. And while Lauren and Marion were having their chat, they didn't notice the hungry, raggedy little dog making his way up towards the table. And then he went under the table and then he jumped up suddenly and the bowl of custard went up into the air and it splattered everywhere. And Lauren started to cry and she said, that was my job, that was my job. And she started to run down the boring and down the boardwalk towards the little shop where they bought the custard powder earlier. And she was roaring, crying. And the woman came out and she said, what's wrong, little girl? Weren't you in here with your mommy earlier? She said, I broke the custard. I broke the custard. And the woman said, well, that's easily fixed. And she went into the shop and she brought out another box of custard. And she said, there you go now. And that's when Lauren noticed that it was kind of a magical shop. There was buckets and shovels. And there was these shapes that you could fill with sand and make shapes on the beach. And there were shells and there was ice cream. And next to the shop, there was a man and he was saying, Periwinkles, Periwinkles for sale, Periwinkles. And she looked at the woman and she said, is a Periwinkle the same as a Twinkle? And the woman said, no, it's not. And then she heard her mother's voice, Lauren, Lauren. And her mother was crying too. And she knelt down on the ground and she said, Mom, why are you crying? And she was wiping away her mother's tears. She said, never run away from mommy again. You gave me an awful fright. And she said, 
I'm sorry, Mum. I won't do that again. And then Mummy said, maybe we both had to have a good cry because Granny's gone to heaven. And then she said, let's make the custard again. And they went back up the boardwalk, up the boring, and they made the custard again. And Mummy said, well, how do we make custard? And Lauren said, you heat the milk. And Marion said, and then Lauren adds the custard powder. And then Mummy said, and then we all sing together. If you go down to the woods today, you better not go alone. And they made new happy memories. And Granny was smiling down at them all the way from heaven. <laughs> so that was our second story. So now I'm going to come to the people who weren't co-creating with us. I might come to John. John Rowe, what did you think of that lovely story? Oh, I loved it. And it brought back memories of you all. And I, 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 years and years ago, probably, I don't know how many years ago, but, but my hair was still white, but it was some decades past. And uh, there was a fairy festival in your, and I, uh, and there was a piper at the front, and then I was next, and uh, there was a parade of children as little people dressed in green, and well, I remember leading this parade or with the piper through, and everyone was in their doorways and looking out, and it was just standing in the doorways we passed by. It was magic, magic. Oh, magic, you know. So look at the release of magic memories when you've told a co-collected story, because your memories will ting off of the memories of somebody else. And also you can put wisdom into these stories without saying, be careful of this or don't do that. You can still get the wisdoms in there. So I'm coming to USA David Thompson there. So USA David Thompson, did you have, did you collect any words of wisdom from that story? Oh, mercy child, whatever you say. <laughs> I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, there was a lot of that, particularly with my father's mother. Mm. Uh, my father's mother was a first generation USA citizen. She and her family had escaped during the or escape, I guess is the right word, during the Easter uprising. Whoa. And um, she had a lot of stories and but not in any way similar to what your story is. Yes. What she would talk about are the, the little people, and I do not like that term because the fae are t as tall as, if not taller than humans. And she would talk about them coming at night when she would have the, the cakes out ready. And in the mornings, she would come out and the cakes would have been frosted already or they would have been moved away from the, the windowsill. So the wisdom that she would impart would be always have food ready yes. for whoever comes to your door, for you do not know their situation. That's right. My mother's side, and this is me, I'm a second generation U.S. American. My mother's side came from Russia, and they left at the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution. So I have a whole bunch of Slavic wisdom tales that are still starting to come up into my head. And I'm like, well, how do I tell these? <laughs> you know, Because it's like, hey, can I really pronounce that name? <laughs> Things like that. But there's still a lot of family and a lot of working together and a lot of just sweet memories, uh -huh. sweet, sweet memories and the wisdom of food because yeah. it's food that brings us together, Absolutely. no matter what language we speak. Yeah. So that is my contribution. Love and if contribution. I may, and if I may, uh, I have a dear friend who has been on World Storytelling Cafe, Amy Bruton Blumel, who is Chickasaw. Okay. And she and I are co-creating, if that's the right word, a story in which the people who came with the Irish immigrants, and I'm talking about the little people again, mm -hmm. the little people met the Chickasaw little people. 
and how they interacted because there was so much intermarriage. So we're working on that. And we're also looking into finding members of the other so-called civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Chippewa, the Choctaw, the Muscogee, and how we can all work together Mm -hmm. where we can do a co-creation of how did the little people interact with each other? Absolutely love that. That is a, um, a project to say, and that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, Maria. I love your telling. Love yours too. But um, David talked about the Chickasaw tribe there, and I've been telling Choctaw stories because Choctaw sent a famine aid to Ireland in the 1800s, and it seems that the, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw were part of one tribe at one time, and there is a beautiful, beautiful story about how they divided, but because it's belonging to their um, to their tribe, we need to hear them tell it. So maybe David can invite his lovely Chickasaw friend to come and tell us about the division of the Chickasaw and the Choctaw tribe. It's a beautiful story. Mwah. Thank you, David. Okay, so I see there now that Cara has come in from Kerry Writers <laughs> Museum. Very welcome, Cara. You know, and it was Cara's idea to apply for the Bealtaine Award. And we're so happy, so happy that we won that award. So thank you, Cara. You're welcome, Maria. Well, we struck gold when we uh, appointed you as our storyteller residence. We were absolutely delighted with the, all the work so far. And I just loved, I, unfortunately, I only could uh, attend one of the, the workshops myself with all the paperwork that has to be done. Mm-hmm. And it was, I, I really enjoyed it. It was all fabulous, fabulous stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm delighted. Sorry, I came in. I was actually here from the start, but I didn't realize. Can you could turn your <laughs> yeah, camera on. <laughs> That's it. We're all learning this new technology, but look at us all after coming together. Isn't it amazing? So David spoke there a little bit about the the fair folk and in Ireland we call them the she it's spelt s-i-d-h-e just to confuse everybody <laughs> so the this next story which was the third story in our Beotana gatherings contained the she David you're gonna love this so um there was there was a lovely man called Yeshi and some people said He's way too happy to be completely intelligent. He can't be all that intelligent and smiling like that all the time. But at the same time, they had an awful lot of time for him. And sometimes people would ask him for their for his advice. And it was only two weeks later when they'd ignored the advice that they'd see the wisdom in his words. Yes, she worked in this kind of big oily factory it was full of noise and the air was thick with demanding and heat and pressure almost like a foundry of old where they were making metal things and it was very oppressive in there but yes she had a way about him he might walk over to the edge of the factory and open a window And if you happened to be on the machine under that window, you might be able to see a bit of blue sky or a bit of soft Irish rain might come in and cool your hot face. Do you know that our Yeshi loved 80s music? Oh, yes, he did. And he always had the radio on. He could be playing songs at high volume, songs like, Come a come a come a come a come a camellia, red, gold and green, red, gold and green. And he'd be pushing the tea trolley and his head would be bouncing along to the song and everybody would smile and some of them would begin to nod along to the song too. And then he'd go down to the canteen and he'd make tea. His tea was so comforting. It was so delicious. It was always exactly the right strength. He had these big tea dispensers and people would go in and they'd take a cup of tea. And along with the tea, yes, she would tell them a grand story 
or he'd sing them an old song or he'd tell them a joke. But whatever happened in that room, when they left it, they felt lighter. He was going around one day, playing his music on the radio, collecting the cups before the tea break, when the music stopped and the death announcements came on. And the death announcement said, Nora O'Shea passed away today. And he started to cry. Big, fat tears. And the people said, are you all right, Jeshi? <gasps> he couldn't even talk. He just walked down the length of the factory to the canteen. One by one, the people switched off their machines and followed Yeshi down to the canteen. They stood there in a great circle and they said, tell us, tell us about Nora Yeshi and find stories of the Banfasa that she was. The wise woman began to pour out of them. She used the nettle to cure the flu, he said. She used the garlic to cure the head cold. She used the lavender to cure nearly everything. She put lemon in and it made it taste sweet. I don't know how she did that. And her chickens, they gave two eggs for every one that my chickens gave. She loved people and she loved animals just as well, he said. And when was the last time you saw her, Yeshi? That would be this morning, he said, as I passed her little cottage and I looked in the window and she was singing an old song. Avaka to Mavuka le Mavoni no Mahemashin. Avaka to Mavuka le. Yes, I go out, she is on her. And that's the last I'll ever hear of her singing, he said. And he bowed his head. And the people stood silent and strong together in a circle, giving him their strength. And then his face began to change. And he began to smile again. I don't think she's gone, he said. When I passed the cottage this morning, when I looked in, there was a great group, a circle just like this circle here, a circle of the she, the Shioga, he said. Oh, the people said, looking at one another. And they joined hands, he explained. And didn't she put out her hands and held on to their hands and she completed the circle. She's not dead at all. She's gone to tear an oak with the she. And off he left. Out of the factory he went. And one by one, all the people followed him. One after the other, down the long road to Nora's house. Then they opened the door and they went in. And they reformed the circle and Yeshi put out his two hands and they put out their hands and they made a big circle. No one knows what happened to those people. They never appeared again. But if you stand at Nora's cottage and see the foxgloves and the hollyhocks and smell the wild garlic, and the beautiful lavender that grows there. If you're very still on a summer's day, far out on the breeze, you might hear, come a, come a, come a, come a, come a chameleon, red, gold and green, red, gold and green. <laughs> Oh, I love that story. So that story was made in co-creation as well, which means that no one mind, no one heart, no one soul would have been able to give that story to the world or either of the other two because they're co-created. So Baba, I'm going to come to you now. Baba, what did you think of that story? First of all, I could listen to you forever in a day. <laughs> That's for you, you. Thank you. I mean, you, 
your essence is what a storyteller does. You you enthrall, you spellbind, you you make us want more. The only sad part about listening to you is that you stop. <laughs> How, however, listening to the month that you mentioned reminded me of an African tradition. And I do it like that because Africa is a continent that yeah. people tend to lump everything like it's one country. Mm -hmm. But there's an African tradition called Sankofa. And Sankofa means looking back to move forward. And this, yes, you, you got it, you got it. And this is what listening to your stories reminds me of and the name of your month, which I have not learned to pronounce yet, but we have to look back to move forward. And to sound mundane, not to sound mundane, those that do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. But those that know their history are granted the possibility of wondrous futures. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm spellbound by you. I'm, I'm almost, almost speechless. Almost. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I knew you would like that, John Rowe. So <laughs> I, I just want to share one more thing and then I'll cede the floor. I, I sent you a, a comment and it said, I used to, I, I had a friend named Kenneth. He spelled his name C-A-I-N-N-E-C-H. Okay. Mm -hmm. You understand that. Yeah. But he was surprised that I knew that that said, that was, you know, said Kenneth. And I said, well, why don't you spell your name that way? He said, because I don't want to appear to be different. Well, never more different a person have I've ever known. I mean, he was multi-talented. He knew, I mean, he knew more than John Rowe and I combined. <laughs> I, I, th I think that's a compliment. Uh, he must have been wise. <laughs> He he what let me tell you how wise he was. He understood women. Oh yes. <laughs> but he was Can wise I have enough not to Can let I have them his number. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next time we met, I had seen his ID, which is a story for another another day. And on his ID, instead of Kenneth as it's spelled K-E-N-N-E-T-H, it now said C-A-I-N-N-E-C-H. Yeah because he had embraced himself and understood that being different is a blessing. Absolutely. And your story reminded me of all that. Uh, Thank you. Not just my story. It belongs to Ray well, McKinley. The collective Lisa yours. Howard, exactly. Paddy yeah, Reed, the collective yours. Michelle, yeah, it's, and Noreen, they were all there. So it was brilliant, you know. So Thank you. Um, Ladies, yeah. you are brilliant beyond brilliant. I cede oh. the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much, Baba. So um, I, I see also that we have Mike and Hannah, who we haven't heard from. So would you like to, to, I don't have a question, but would you like to contribute to what you think of these co-created stories? You're Mike, are you right if I go first? Yeah. Um, absolutely amazing. I've, I've had a tear in my eye a few times. Um, because so many memories come back through the stories. Mm. You know, your middle story just reminded me of my mum. I put in the chat, you know, who used to say, sometimes you just need a good cry. Mm. You know, the 80s music with Coach Club, you know, I, I grew up with that. And just that amazing image at the end of the people coming together in, in the circle. Mm. Yeah, no, you've, you've, as Baba was saying, you know, I'm absolutely mesmerized by your storytelling but it, it's it's bringing back some wonderful, happy, sad memories. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, you know that's the beauty. It's you bring you bring and you add something to the the pot. And in in Ireland, we talk about the three day stew, and about the shared <laughs> pot, and people putting <laughs> in what they could, yeah, yeah, yeah. and a bit of everything. And no stew tastes the same as another stew. It's like a fingerprint because everybody brings their own little special thing to that, you know? So what beautiful um, reflections, Hannah, that's, you have it. That's exactly what co-creation is. It's the collection and reverence and sharing of memories. So mwah, thank you for that, you know? And Mike. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been really moved. I've been sitting here moved and um... The, the, the story of the little girl and her grandmother's custard that 
um, it just kind of hit me because I, I never knew either of my grandmothers. They died before I was old enough to know them. That one died before I was even born. Mm. And I, it, it just had me sitting here wishing that I could have known them and had that kind of relationship like she had with her grandmother. And, but then I thought, well, I had that with my own mother mm -hmm. and with her aunts who were my great aunts. So, and it, it's been amazing. I mean, the stories have just been so good and they've just felt like remembered reality. Yeah. You um, that. Yes. And it's just been fabulous. Yeah. Oh, Mike, thank you so much. The reflections are gorgeous. The whole thing, making a story, telling a story, and gathering the reactions, you know, it, it just, it's very, very special. I love, I love co-created stories for that reason. And Baba mentioned, you know, kind of um, the power of words. And I remember one time as a set dancer, um, you know, we, we met this beautiful group of Malawians and our music blended and our stories blended but the dancers didn't blend. We had to dance on opposite ends of the stage because the Irish <laughs> are very stiff and the Africans are all like, you know, a beautiful, like, you know, kind of movement in every bone of their body. So we taught them a phonetic Irish song and they taught us a phonetic African song. So because Baba gave us that memory, I offer you the song and it's this. La bitso la morena yesu hale boque hale boque hale boque hale boque hale boque la bitso la morena yesu hale boque and i love the fact that you had the same rhythm and it went slow and it came fast. And we have an Irish song like that with English words, which we robbed from Scotland. So I offer that one as well. And it's, we, we teach rhythm through this song for dancing. So you put the baby on your hip and the baby would start moving in an Irish way <laughs> to the music. And, this, and the song is this. Uh, he shall have a fishy in a little dishy. He shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. And then we teach them to go faster by saying, He shall have a fishy in a little dishy. He shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. And then when we're trying to put them to sleep, we say, He shall have a fishy in a little dishy. He shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. <laughs> so it's a great way of teaching rhythm you know to to share our words like that you know so thank you for that baba that brought that wisdom back so we're coming uh to the end we've been can you believe we've been talking with one another for nearly an hour it's time goes by so quickly it just gone you know and when you we did these workshops, we actually spent two hours and it felt like 10 minutes each time. <laughs> you know? So I would like to offer to John that when we go to the beautiful um, Marrakesh in February, that we co-create a story that will be our shared story of Marrakesh. How's about that? Well, I think that that's that's going to be... That's going to be one amazing co-creation. I mean, God, there's possibly going to be 50 storytellers in in this ancient city, uh, sort of 30, 40, traveling from all over the world, and, uh, and 10, 10, uh, 10 from Marrakesh, uh, which, you know, is, is probably the even older as a, tra a storytelling tradition than Ireland. Um, Although we, you know, we could have some disputes in Marrakesh over that, um, <laughs> yeah, in the nicest possible way. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, a Baba wants to say something. I knew he would. <laughs> I take after you, John Rowe, and I mean that as a compliment. But Maria and group, I, I, I forgot the name of your group, but you reminded me of something. 
when I first started out, I didn't know I was a storyteller per se, but when I first started out, I used to do an exercise in reverse uh, to what you did as a collective. And what I did is I would divide the audience up into three or four parts, point to someone in the audience or point to the audience and ask them for a word or a sound or a color. And then I would take those three or four words and I would make a story up on the spot mm -hmm. right there. And yeah. then it would be call and response because I would have that section repeat their word in the course of the story. And you just brought that to me and it just gave me a wonderful, warm, fuzzy feeling because one of the first places I got to tell that story was at the school where my mother taught, may she rest in power. Yeah. Oh. I have to say, we, we, we do... Um, we do improv stories like that in Kerry Reicher's museum as well. And I love it. I love it. I, I, I've got to come in wait, before I announce what's coming up, which yeah. it, I have to get this in quickly. I, I must come up with one quick anecdote to follow Baba. Baba. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I apologize in advance, but that asking for a word can get you into trouble. I was doing some street stuff and just collecting words. And uh, then I was making stuff up and, you know, I was doing it on the side of a van with, uh, you know, sound a bit of paper. And I went up to this guy. I I was going up to total strangers and say, can I have a word? And uh, this guy said, go away. I said, it's all right, mate. I just want a word. <laughs> and he just thought I was trying to get him into some kind of religious thing. Um, and it didn't occur to me afterwards why I was getting all this... Uh, all, all, all this aggravation back again and uh you know i kind of gave up <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it never occurred to me that can i had a, have a word had that double meaning at that time and he gave you two words go away he did it yeah they did indeed thank you for that right we have now maria before i do the announcement i mean what you've done tonight is amazing. It is truly connecting the world by story, which is the name of Monday nights, um, and uh, and 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 your co and your co-creators there. Uh, I, I've got to say, you know, Maria's Maria's the mouth, and I mean that in the nicest, most amazing way. She is the most fantastic mouth, <laughs> but the. Uh, but yours, you you all created those stories, and a round of applause for all of you. And Kerry, Cara down at Kerry Writers Museum for just getting all this together. Mm -hmm. I mean, without with without without people like Cara, they, you know, these things don't happen. I you know, well, I run projects and stuff like that, and uh, you know, and and. You know, I, I, I've got a. I've actually, she's called Maria. Is my Cara, and she, and uh, you know, like I just say, look, I've got this idea, Maria. Can you, can, can you sort it out? And, and there's, um, but, but a round of applause for Cara, Maria, and all the other uh, co-creators. Dan, can can I just say that those three stories are available on the Kerry Roger Museum's YouTube channel. Right. Well, we'll, can you put that up uh, on the World Storytelling Cafe community page? Yes, I will. Uh, and then, and then we'll, you know, that that will direct people up there. It'll be fantastic. We have, as always, amazing stuff coming up. We've got tomorrow. We have at five o'clock uh, UK time. Is um, every Tuesday is our world. Uh, our international young tellers it's tellers 18 years and younger and it'll be a special night this this week because hopefully if the internet's up we'll have the children back from gaza who all usually tell on uh, uh you know and it's been uh David Heathfield, who I see down there, has, has worked with them an awful lot in the in the hands up project and but it's been you know, our hearts, are not only with them, they've been in our mouths all week to just to see, to make sure those children are able to come back to us. Um, so hopefully they, they we, we know they're safe, but we know, um, well, for the moment, but we're hoping their internet's up so they can come and see us in person. That's tomorrow night. Then Friday... We've got, uh, uh, we do always do stories for children every Friday, six o'clock. And this, we've got uh, Simran Nagurani um, from India. 
Um, and uh, then on Saturday, I'm taking a leave of absence for the morning because someone's actually paying me to be on the net elsewhere, you know, and uh, as working storytellers, <laughs> Go for the money. <laughs> and, uh, so, so um, yeah, I'm getting David Heathfield to work for free this Saturday. And, uh, so we have, um, so Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, bless you, David. And uh, uh, 10 o'clock is, is um, in the morning. We do, a, once a month, we do a, a morning one so storytellers can come on from Asia and Australasia instead of getting up in the middle of the night to join us. Sunday... We, we, Sunday, this is important. Everyone come, everyone put money in the pot because it's Rock the Casbar. And Gary, Gary Cordingly is running the festival fundraiser and we're raising funds for the Marrakesh Festival. Um, so uh, we're, we're doing all the Marrakesh, this fe wonderful festival in, uh, in February in Marrakesh is being done totally on smoke and mirrors. So, uh, which is the way things can be well Ali is in charge of the magic carpet and he always uh, drives it magnificently and we're hoping uh, that that's all going to work uh then um oh, oh uh then uh oh the following Friday you see the guy Baba C 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 is doing the children's stories Friday the 4th and uh, Monday, uh, Monday the seventh, uh, and uh, David asked if, if you come back to that, Maria, because you were did so much on his last one, which is David Thompson UK uh, talking about uh, two worlds in one, which is looking at arts and disability. And I've just got to say this: it's not till late, but I've just. Um, it's it's I've only put this together today. Um, one, I've got Tim Tingle coming up later in June, who's the Choctaw storyteller. Um, and but then I've just got today. I've just been in touch with Dr. Kathleen Hudson, who had started the Texas Music Heritage Foundation. She's down at the Bob Dylan celebrations down in Mexico at the moment for the eight years, but she's, she's, she's coming on and that's going to be me and her nattering about, because she's led this amazing life. She's been a rodeo rider, rider, rider. Um, when I first met her, she was sitting on top of this beautiful white horse with a back hat on one side. And uh, it was, you know, and she was a barrel rider. And then um, I didn't know that she ran the depart the literature department virtually of uh, Shriner University in Kerrville in Texas, and then she set up the Texas Music Heritage Foundation. She's retired now, but she ran that for fifteen years. Wrote a wrote in a series of amazing books, uh, a lot about women in country music and so forth. So, I, and we're not just in country, but in that folk, in the folk stuff. Um, so. I'm, re I'm really enthusiastic, as you can tell, that I've managed to get hold. I managed to find her in Mexico, tracked her down in Mexico and got her. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so anyway, got just loads, look at the schedule. I try and keep Ali up to date on the schedule. Ali's, uh, Ali's forever. Now you're coming back to me, Maria. You've got your hand I up. Um, I, we have some heavy hitters, Irish storytellers here right now, you know. Um, how would they get involved in this? Well, they, well, uh, you, you can uh, email me um, or or Ali. Um, John at johnrow.com is easy. Yeah. But we do have just said not next Sunday, but on Sunday the sixth. This is for your diaries. Mm -hmm. Is an oh, you, we every two weeks we do. At six o'clock, we do the worldwide story round, and everyone can come in to tell uh, to tell stories on that. Uh, so there did, you go, Ray. Have I seen you on the bar? Did I see you on the bar? I know I've seen you somewhere before, Ray. Uh, somewhere. 
Yeah, she saw me in Ipswich at Bards Aloud. <laughs> with Bards I Aloud. saw you at Bards Aloud. I knew yeah, I'd seen you, you around. I, I, as well. <laughs> yeah. I, knew, I knew I'd seen you recently somewhere. Yeah. But uh, the six is our next worldwide story round at six o'clock. Everyone's oh, welcome to come there. You know, I, th I think I think we just need to do a sort. We would you, Maria. Would you care to do a Monday night where you introduced as tellers the people you be, you know, like this wonderful bunch of people, and not just from Kerry from from the museum as a groups, but just you know. Yeah, absolutely. Because Maria's Ma Ma Maria's Maria Maria's Irish night, I think is. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I'm up for that. So yeah. Anita, Ray, Paddy, Michelle, you're all, Noreen, you're all booked. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Right, um, I, leave that, I leave that in your capable hands, Maria. Yeah, just so, tell me and I'll and I'll do that. So, fantastic. So, it's been a brilliant night. Lots of new friends, which I love. That's what I love about the cafe. Every time we run a live thing... You know, we we just we just make new friends from all around the world, and I now I now I've now got a contact at Kerry Writers Museum, and that's really good. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> right, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for the, providing the magic carpet for tonight. And thank you, everyone who came. Big round of applause again for Maria and the co-creators. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, Until the next time to be continued. Until definitely be continued. <laughs> Good night, guys. Mar Maria, is it too late for me to ask you something? She may be gone. She's gone. She's gone. I'll have to. I'll have to come oh, back yes. to it. It's too late. Daddy, <laughs> what did you want to ask, David? Is it personal, or can we all? Can we all get, get in and? Uh... Maybe you can help me. You can. Where do you go? You can help me, John, because you were there from the start. I imagine. Basically, um, I I caught most of Maria's session, but I, I listened to the I listened to a lot of it on Facebook before I joined. But I didn't get the very beginning, and I was just wondering, did she talk about the the procedures that she follows with the story uh, making? I'm really interested in that. She did, but you know, you can go back and listen to the recording and find that out. Oops, we lost her, Patty. Before we go, may I ask you a question about your name? I watch it. I did watch the yes, the recording. Did she give any any Did she give any any references to read about the processes she uses? I believe she did that at the beginning, just before she started telling the story. Brilliant. I'll watch it. I'll watch the recording and catch it there. Brilliant. All right. Lovely, Patty. I had a question about your name. So, if, pardon my ignorance. So, is Patty? your formal name or is that what we would call a nickname um not saint patrick uh, you know, did you ever hear of saint patrick yes yeah he, he came to ireland about 432 a.d we were we were all pagans up until then and he brought he brought christianity to us and uh, that's why we have saint patrick's day and he he teached uh, three divine persons in the one God, you know, the Catholic faith, right? With, with the shamrock, and uh, so that has become a national emblem. And Paddy is the commonly accepted shortened version of Patrick. That's you, what we call the nickname. You you will find an awful lot of people in Ireland have been christened Patrick, but the, I you you will very rarely hear them addressed as Patrick. They'll always be addressed as Paddy, usually, or Pat. Okay, I, I, I was curious about that because the the name, the word Paddy, has a very mixed reception among people of African American dis, uh, really? descent. Yeah, because the early uh, slave catchers, uh, they drove they were they were Irish and they drove Paddy wagons. Ah, and yeah. yeah, and even yeah. up until the last couple of decades. 
police um, um, what, uh, vehicles for pouring a lot of people into it. They were called paddy wagons. Yeah, well, so, but I, I knew the name didn't have to do with that, yeah. but I was curious as to whether Patty was a formal or informal name. And I appreciate you giving me that bit of information yeah. because as a living library, I can never know too much. Indeed. And I'll give you another bit of history or another bit of um, sort of what you mean, social attribution. The reason paddy wagons are called paddy wagons in the States and in Britain is uh, the Irish are known to have a fondness for drink. That's true. And, and when they'd fall out of the pubs on a Saturday night, uh, they'd be put into a wagon and taken away to the cop shop. And the, the wagon normally had more Irish in it than any other nationality. So I, I was, a, I, so I was aware of that called, too, but I was being polite. Wagons. 